Hola, hola. Hola a todos, bienvenidos. Latinoamericanos y caribeños. Welcome. Um, invito a, a quienes se hayan anotado a la lista para hacer sus presentaciones a sentarse en la mesa, así tienen un micrófono cerca. Y quienes no se hayan anotado y tengan intención de hacer una presentación, eh, lo van a hacer al final de la lista. Sofi Bueno, de nuevo bienvenidos a todos. Este es el IGF Flag Space. La idea de este espacio, que ya es la tercera edición, si mal no recuerdo, básicamente es intercambiar entre las organizaciones operando a nivel regional en Latinoamérica y el Caribe, intercambiar proyectos, darse a conocer, intercambiar proyectos que tuvieron durante este año y los proyectos que tienen pensados para el año que viene. Eh, lo que viene pasando es que a partir de, la, de estas presentaciones se generan algunas sinergias eh, para el, el año próximo y espero que este año vuelva a ocurrir. Eh, así que bueno, sin, sin más, eh, los invito a, a, lo, a quienes se anotaron en la lista. En primer lugar, yo aquí tengo un orden y después a los que no se anotaron y quieran hacer sus aportes, eh, que lo, lo avisen sobre el final. Eh, son presentaciones muy cortas, eh, máximo cinco minutos, si son más breves mejor, eh, en las cuales tienen que contarnos a todos eh, quién, en nombre de qué organización están aquí, qué es lo que hace, a qué se dedica su organización, qué hicieron durante 2000, eh, 2019 y qué tienen previsto, qué planes tienen para 2020. Así que bueno, sin más, eh, voy a seguir el orden que tengo aquí anotado. Ah, no, perdón. Fuera de orden tenemos a un presentador remoto, no sé si es Rodrigo de la Parra, así lo liberamos cuando pueda. No sé si estás conectado, Rodrigo. Remote present. No. Remote. Ok, 
Bueno, vamos a esperar un ratito más a Rodrigo. Eh, bueno, voy a seguir con la lista. Eh, primero en la lista es Javier Palero, pero no lo veo. Javier Palero de Access Now. No lo veo por ahí, así que cuando venga seguirá. Ok. Parece que encontramos a Rodrigo, perdón. And then, okay. Bueno, Rodrigo, si estás escuchando, primero tenés que sumarte a la speaking queue eh, y luego recién ahí pueden agregarte para que hables. Bueno, seguimos entonces con ADC, está, eh, la vía Valeria por ahí que estaba. No sé si está ahí. ¿Cómo? A, ADC, perdón, las dos son Valerias. No sé si está Vale ahí. No, bueno, vamos con APC entonces y después volveremos para atrás. Ok, gracias Nacho. Buenas tardes. Vamos a hacer en español. ¿En inglés? Buenísimo. ¿Sí? ¿Está bien? ¿Para todo el mundo? Ok. Eh, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Valeria Betancourt. Yo soy la directora del programa de, de políticas de información y comunicación de la Asociación para el Progreso de las Comunicaciones, la APC. La APC es una red internacional. Eh, una red y una organización con presencia en más de 80 países, eh, países sí, en los cinco continentes. Eh, son, eh, eh, congrega organizaciones de sociedad civil que están como comprometidas con el uso de las tecnologías de información y comunicación eh, para contribuir a que todas las personas tengan un acceso fácil y asequible a Internet con propósitos de contribuir al ejercicio de derechos humanos, al desarrollo, a la justicia social. Este, bueno, en el, eh, en el 2019, eh, parte de un buen énfasis de nuestro trabajo estuvo alrededor de eh, consolidar y fortalecer el movimiento de redes comunitarias. Mi colega Nicolás Pache les va a comentar un poco más al respecto. Pero en, en términos del trabajo que hemos estado impulsando en la región, les puedo referir que eh, conjuntamente con varias de las instituciones que están acá, eh, y como parte de aplicar el modelo eh, multisectorial, eh, se ha estado impulsando la regionalización de los debates sobre la gobernanza de Internet, así que hemos hecho parte del comité de programa de la GIGF y eh, fuimos parte del comité organizador de, de este evento. Eh, creemos que sigue siendo una plataforma relevante para eh, la formulación y el desarrollo de una agenda regional sobre gobernanza de Internet y en el 2009, eh, en el 2020, perdón, pensamos estar involucrados y apoyando decididamente un proceso de reestructuración de la IGF, de modo que sea un espacio relevante para eh, la manera en la que ha ido evolucionando la dinámica y la discusión de gobernanza de Internet globalmente y en la región. Eh, por otro lado, hemos estado explorando eh, cuál es el impacto de la adopción de sistemas de inteligencia artificial eh, en distintos contextos y para el efecto se han generado eh, diversos eh, reportes de país en América Latina que miran en, el, en contextos específicos el impacto de, de estos sistemas en el ejercicio de derechos humanos, en el desarrollo y en la justicia social. Y esto está, se va a presentar en una publicación que se llama el Global Information Society Watch eh, mañana, para los que están interesados. Eh, y estos informes de país están enmarcados en una reflexión eh, un poco más general, más abarcativa, que mira el tema de inteligencia artificial desde distintos lentes, incluyendo el lente feminista. Eh, eh, yo creo que puede ser interesante, sobre todo, para entender eh, cómo, eh, se, no solo cómo se están implementando estos sistemas de inteligencia artificial en los países, sino, cual, como les decía, cuál está siendo el impacto de estos en la vida de las personas. Eh, y eh, parte del trabajo que hemos estado haciendo también es eh, un involucramiento sostenido y regular con eh, el instrumento regional de derechos humanos en la región, que es la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos y la Convención, a fin de poder avanzar una agenda en materia de derechos digitales, generar concientización en los actores del sistema interamericano sobre la importancia de mirar a la, al ejercicio de derechos en la esfera digital. Eh, sobre todo con los avances eh, 
legislativos y regulatorios que se ven en la región en distintos ámbitos, incluyendo eh, los de la vigilancia masiva y los de la vigilancia eh, direccionada. Eh, y les voy a pasar con mi colega Nicolás para que les cuente un poco sobre el trabajo en, en redes comunitarias que hemos estado haciendo en el ámbito de los esfuerzos que desplegamos sobre el, la inclusión digital. Disculpas, eh, Nicolás. Tenemos gente del, gente del Caribe, eh, por lo tanto, quienes se sientan cómodos hablando en inglés, los invito a hacerlo. Lamentablemente no tenemos traducción, así que quienes puedan presentar en inglés sería... No, no habían llegado todavía, pero empezaron a llegar y eh, sería interesante. Thanks for raising that up and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it would be, yeah, well, it's a pleasure to be here. I, actually, Valeria invited me uh, just a few minutes ago, and I was not aware that we were having a regional meeting, so it's amazing to see you all around here. Uh, I am uh, Nicolas Pache. I am part of uh, the Association for Progressive Communications as one of the coordinators for the Community Networks project. Uh, for those that don't know, briefly, community networks are communities that uh, haven't been connected by the market, haven't been connected by the states, and will not uh, know now, not now, not probably in the near future, be connected by anyone. So they have decided to do, the, do it by themselves. Uh, it's a, an amazing accomplishment that communities uh, with all of, the, uh, all of the elements against them, they still do connectivity for their own interests, for their own needs. Uh, we have been working during the last uh, two years uh, plus, a little bit more, but APC historically has been also uh, working on uh, access. And lately, for the last two years, so focusing in uh, specifically in supporting the ecosystem of community networks, uh, pushing for a, a healthy regulatory framework that can nurture the growth of community networks, a healthy environment for them to grow. And it's a multidimensional problem, like uh, from a very high level, as we are all here, uh, the regulatory frameworks uh, have been historically defined uh, at, um, uh, for, for corporations, for, so incentivizing um, the market. And it's a market that during the last 30 years have failed in connecting some part of our society. They are effective in some, some of them, and they are very ineffective in many others. So we need to ha have a different strategy, and that's what we have been working on for the last two years and a half. This last year, specifically, at the regulatory level, we have been doing regulatory workshops at the different gatherings that have happened across the globe, uh, both in um, Central America and, and South America. I don't have specific details, but uh, we can get them for those that are interested in, and they have been very uh, well attended and uh, um, intense in the reflections and the changes that uh, have been reflected in the, in, in the different countries. Together with that, we are doing a, a com, um, comprehensive research of the regulatory frameworks in worldwide in relation to community networks. You can check that out at wiki.opentelecomdata.org. And it's a nation, nation by nation, country by country study of the different regulatory frameworks and the limitations or possibilities of community networks around the world, and specifically in Latin America. Um, also, this project has uh, an element of supporting grassroots organizations in the territory to uh, uh, support the growth of the movement itself. Uh, we know that community networks is not a top-down uh, thing. It's not something that we will decide that will solve the connectivity problems of the world from here, but it's in the hands of the communities that live in our countries that uh, are already forgotten or displaced in many of our re realities. Uh, it's in their hands to do the connectivity, and it's in our uh, hands to support them in that process. So this year, we decided to put all our effort in supporting the strengthening of 12 community networks around the world, four in Latin America, one in Argentina, one in Brazil, uh, two in Brazil, and one in Colombia. 
and through strengthening key actors of the community network ecosystem, strengthening the movement as, as a whole. And it has shown very strong uh, uh, progress. Uh, the, different, the four community networks that we are uh, strengthening, they have created a regional uh, alliance, coalition of sorts. It's informal yet, but it includes Cuba, Ecuador, uh, Mexico, and uh, Sorry, my mind is sleeping. Uh, but uh, so th they are already supporting other actors in the region. Uh, um, I think I'm going to stop there, but uh, thank you for the space and eager to hear more news from the region. Thank you very much, Nicolás. Um, we have uh, Rodrigo de la Parra online. Rodrigo. Can you hear us? We cannot hear you. Just a second. Yeah. No, the mic. Shouting at you. I hope we can solve this. Okay, so Rodrigo, you're gonna have to wait for a couple of minutes more. Um, next in the list is Vladimir Cortez from Articulo 19. I don't know if he's around. Okay, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, so, First of all, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm Vladimir Cortez, the Digital Rights Program Officer in Article 19 in the uh, Mexico and Central America office. Uh, there are a couple of things that I would like to, to share. Uh, first of all, it's uh, something that we are announcing uh, this, uh, well, these days, but are going to present uh, furtherly. So we are launching an observatory on content removal in, in Mexico in a three-level review. The first one is uh, requests uh, from the states made and private uh, actors made for, uh, to, digital platform, to digital platforms. In this order, what we are uh, doing, what we are like uh, creating is uh, request uh, making an information uh, request to analyze how the states are uh, doing and conducting this type of uh, requests to uh, remove contents to uh, social media platforms, to digital platforms. The second, the second level of analysis that we are conducting and that we are going to, uh, to furtherly present, it's uh, the a direct communication with journalists and media because we, what we are looking at, what we are like seeing, it's how it's being used uh, 
data protection, intellectual property, uh, copyrights issues to take down information that we consider as a public uh, interest. In that way, uh, we are developing this uh, close tight connections through workshops and focus groups and uh, other communications ways to analyze and to see how it is uh, this repercussion in terms of freedom of expression, in terms of access to uh, information. And the third level of analysis of this observatory on content removal, it's uh, uh, how uh, also social media platforms are executing this uh, term of, uh, of, ser of uh, service that they have, these community standards, which also are uh, deeply affecting uh, the flow of information are deeply affecting uh, how uh, things are going on, particularly in context of, uh, of protest and uh, also in the exercise of uh, uh, journalistic uh, pieces that uh, have to be online, but uh, social media platform platforms are applying this type of uh, uh, norms which uh, directly affect. So that's something that uh, we uh, are going to be happy to, to share some of the, uh, of the results and uh, formally the presentation of this uh, observatory. On the second uh, level, uh, what we also would like to, to share, it's uh, a work that we are conducting and furtherly also uh, being publishing around uh, online protest, which is also uh, being framed in a uh, regional consultation that we are going to have the 4th and the 5th of uh, December in Mexico City uh, around the general observation uh, uh, number 37 by uh, United Nations on Peaceful of Assembly regarding the uh, Article 21 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. We believe that it is uh, really important and uh, some of uh, uh, different organizations around Latin America are going to be there and uh, we believe it's important to uh, to tell the Human Rights Committee and to establish the uh, progressive and protection of the uh, of the rights of, of, of peaceful assembly, particularly of what has happening now in, in Ecuador, what has happening in now, right now in Colombia, uh, in Bolivia, in Chile and uh, different regions. So we uh, believe that this is going to be uh, also uh, very important to, uh, uh, to share with you. Uh, finally, uh, we are also having a broader discussions in terms of uh, online, uh, vi online violence in, in Mexico. Uh, there is like a strong and a very uh, important debate uh, to include in panel codes the uh, non-consensual distribution of uh, sexual images which we are believing uh, it is important to, to tackle but uh, there are like serious warnings in terms of uh, how it will affect also uh, freedom of expression, access to information, the exercise of uh, journalistic work in the way it's uh, being redacted. So we are going also to uh, present and inform a uh, crossing of uh, online violence, freedom of expression, and uh, the penal codes. And uh, just to finalize, also would like to share that we are working closely with uh, Red en Defensa de los Derechos Digitales on uh, disinformation with, uh, with migrants. Uh, this is a work that we are also conducting directly with uh, journalists in, in, in Mexico. We believe it's important to attend the disinformation issues, not just around uh, electoral context, but also working this closely with uh, media and with uh, journalists in order also like to preserve uh, the flow of information. So that's something that we uh, just want uh, very uh, briefly to, uh, to share. And uh, just like for uh, the last, uh, last words, there is an important debate also in Mexico around whistleblowers. Uh, we are working in a collaboration with some other organizations to uh, uh, working closely with, uh, with the Mexican uh, government and some other agencies to create a national law to protect uh, whistleblowers in, in Mexico, which we also believe it's 
uh, important to frame in terms of uh, access to information, in terms of uh, freedom of expression, and uh, that is something that uh, uh, furtherly we also would like to, to share how it's, how it's advancing this. Um, there is actually now uh, a platform uh, Sorry, online to leak uh, information, but there are like still lots of work to do in terms of uh, protecting uh, those who are revealing uh, information for on public interest. Okay. So that's uh, for all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vladimir. I'm going to ask the next, next presenters to be really concise. Uh, we had five minutes. Now it's shor shortened to four. <laughs> and I'm, I'm going to put an alarm with the microphone uh, in order, so I, I am not the responsible for interrupting your, your speeches. Uh, the next one is going to be Juan Jung from ASIET. Juan, you have the floor. Thank you. It is a pleasure for being here. Um, ASIET is the Latin America Telecom Association of Operators. It is uh, an association with 35 years. Um, and it is present in, in most countries of, of the region. We have as associates uh, the telecom operators and our main aim is to contribute to, to the full digitalization of Latin America. Uh, for that purpose, we, are, we, we try to strengthen the public and private dialogue with governments and with regulators and with authorities. We are, we are also part of the LAC IGF committee program. Uh, we support the LAC IGF and we are present in every, every year. Uh, we are also co-organizers of the Latin America Telecommunication Congress. Last year it was in Cordoba, in Argentina. Uh, for next year the venue is still to be decided. Uh, and we invite everybody of you to be present when we are able to, to communicate the full details. ASIET also has a think tank, the CEDLA, the Center of Studies, through which we provide papers, analysis, uh, studies, and we have a close link with universities in order to provide links, uh, to provide inputs uh, for, to improve the quality of the public policies. So that's it. I remain available if any, anyone has an, any question. Thank you. Th thank you very much, uh, Juan. I think we have Rodrigo from ICANN. <coughs> Rodrigo. Sorry about that. Hello. Oh, hello. Can you all hear me? Hola, hola, hola. Can you hear me? Okay, so thank you and um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, Nacho, for the opportunity. Congratulations for organizing this, this again. Uh, I wish I would have been with you uh, in person. So uh, very quickly, so my, my name is Rodrigo de la Parra. I'm responsible for ICANN engagement in the Latin America and the Caribbean region. Um, I, I'm sure that uh, most of you are aware of what ICANN is, but ICANN mission is to ensure a stable and secure operation of the internet unique identifier systems. Um, for ICANN, it's very important to have presence in all of the regions, right? As you know, for this region, for the Latin America and Caribbean region, the main uh, you know, program that drives our activities is a community-based regional strategy. 
which uh, has four main pillars. Uh, one of them, uh, perhaps the most important of them, is how to encourage participation from the different stakeholder groups in ICANN uh, proceedings. Um, the, the next one, and this is more or less an evolution of participation, is how to make, how to make this participation a meaningful participation from uh, stakeholders in the LAC region. So we have uh, many projects attached to these, uh, um, to these pillars. Uh, one of them very successful has been to you know, develop capacity in regional stakeholders to participate fully in those. We have two additional, let's say, more operational uh, objectives or, or pillars. One of them is to strengthen the DNS uh, infrastructure across the Latin American and Caribbean region. And the fourth one will be to uh, help, you know, folks that are interested in developing, um, you know, the DNS industry uh, in the way of registries, registrars uh, in the LAG region to become active participants as well. Um, this strategic plan, which has been put in place by the community in the region, needs to evolve. I can is in the midst of uh, implementing a new strategic plan for 2021 to 2025. Um, this plan has been approved by the community and will be starting to be implemented in uh, June 2020. So we are working now together with our council uh, in the LAG region. The council is made up of um, representatives of each of the stakeholder groups at ICANN from the LAC region. And uh, we're going to have it ready perhaps by uh, May so that we are aligned with the new strategic plan of ICANN and that, that from, from the region. So that's our, our main highlight. And of course, uh, for all of you that are not aware, uh, the next uh, global ICANN meeting will take place in Mexico, in Cancun, in the month of March. We are expecting to have many uh, stakeholders from the region participating at ICANN. As you all know, uh, after the uh, transition of the IANA functions, it's becoming more crucial to have a more diverse uh, a multi-stakeholder ecosystem at ICANN. We are working very hard to do that. ICANN has established five regional offices and one of them is based in Montevideo, in La Casa de Internet, together with uh, many of the organizations that are participating in this session, including, of course, LAC-TLD, LACNIC, ISOC, ALAI, ASIET, uh, ICOMLAC, GLADA, etc. Uh, so uh, we are doing more from the office. We're getting closer to our stakeholders and uh, we are open for any uh, of them if they have questions or they want to participate more actively at ICANN. So uh, Nacho, this will be my uh, presentation and thank you very much for your patience in making this connection happen. Greetings to everybody. Uh, thank you very much, Rodrigo. Uh, now, on the list we have, we're going to go back to access. Uh, now we have uh, Gaspar, I think. Ah, over there. You have four minutes. Hi, can you listen? Hi, everyone. My name is Gaspar Bisanu. I work for the LATAM policy team for Access Now. Access Now is an international organization working in more than 40 countries around the world. Uh, our work is basically working on those sectors at risk uh, when it comes to technology issues. Um, particularly, our work in Latin America consists in the analysis and advocacy actions uh, on public policies. Uh, this past year, we've been working mainly on three main issues, basically uh, data protection in the region. Um, we've been working with freedom of expression cases, and this is also another issue we are att trying to attend at a global level. Um, and also cases regarding surveillance. Uh, basically, my, my, my 
most important work is regarding, as I said, on data protection. We've been trying to cooperate with different local organizations on the developing of these modern frameworks, similar as the GDPA, uh, the GDPR, sorry. Uh, and uh, I think that that particular job is going to continue through all to 2020. Uh, the same as surveillance, that is like uh, a trend issue right now in the in the whole region. Um, basically, what we are trying to do is to uh, assess local organizations on the work that they are, the great job that they are already doing, and trying to develop new strategies on how to increase our relations with the public sector, with private companies, and, and etc. Um, we also, one important uh, arm of the organization is the helpline that is based in Costa Rica. What they do basically is to provide services regarding security issues to different persons at stake, uh, journalists, activists, human rights defenders. Uh, they are incident handlers, and I think it's one of the most important um, arms of the organizations in terms of uh, the work that we do for the region. Um, and for next year, I think that a very important thing is, uh, is our own event called RightsCon that is happening at Costa Rica. Uh, that's a great opportunity to discuss, it's going to be a great dis opportunity to discuss uh, the, the situation that we are currently um, suffering in the region, mainly in Central America that I think is a region that has to be particularly attended. And of course that I hope that we get to see you all there to have discussions before that happen and to have a you know, coverage of all the, the um, situations and all the work that you are doing as a way to expand that and to have a better communication between us all. Um, I think that's kind of a summary. I think I took less than four minutes, but I think <laughs> it's enough. <laughs> Thank you very much, Gaspar. Now we have Franco from Cele, from Argentina. Franco. Okay. Yes. Here we yeah. Thank you, Ignacio, for continue pushing this space for many years. So. Thank you for that. I'm Franco Serra from the Center of Study on Freedom of Expression from the University of Palermo. We are based in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And for those who don't know CELE, the center um, produces legal and capacity, legal analysis and capacity building and for government and non-government actors dedicated to the promotion and defense of freedom of expression and other digital rights, and particularly in Latin America. Today I uh, would like to share with you one of our main projects. This is a project that we have been working on since in 2016. It's a uh, legislative observatory on freedom of expression in Latin America. And this observatory has a website. You can check it now on www.observatoriolegislativocele.com. The idea of this observatory that it will be a, or is a tool for policymakers, for lawmakers, academic activists, and some of you maybe, and to monitor legislative develops and development and track and the impact of internet regulation and debates on freedom of expression in the region. This observatory gathers laws and bill of law over, and over time and in an effort to assess how um, internet regulation is affecting understanding, common understanding of freedom of expression in Latin America. And until this year, the observatory includes uh, access to the text of more than 200 laws and 500 views of law from eight different countries Argentina, Ecuador, Mexico, Peru, Guatemala, Colombia, 
Paraguay and Chile, and for the next month, uh, will we include the legislative information regarding Brazil? So this platform is quite unique in, in the region, and as I said, it's a powerful tool. Um, from this project, we uh, also work with free speech experts in, in these different countries and to select the re relevant legislation and also to analyze it. And when this is possible, offer some contextualization and through and articles and academic papers that and they are also available in the website that I said. And the analysis of this and legislative information um, and is under or are under um, 20 categories like type of legislation, type of sanction, country, date, etc. But this is important and, and analyze the compliance of the inter American three part test under the, the inter American three part test that is legality, necessity, and proportionality. This is the best way to analyze when this restriction to freedom of expression is okay or no is okay. And, and all this information is available on the, in, on the website in open format and to use it by different actors and from different purposes and maybe to regulator, to uh, legislator, to congressman, congresswomen, for example, and journalists. And in this sense, we believe that uh, this monitoring is important in a double way. And this is maybe important for this reason. On the one hand, because it contributes with empirical evidence, that is a vacuum in social science research in Latin America, on how the most important Latin American Congress and the uh, most uh, legislative productive Congresses in Latin America are regulating over these issues today. And on the other hand, uh, because it may serve to identify uh, some controversial issues, some areas um, that require for research or even litigation, for example. And, and uh, Franco? Yes, sure. You are on time. Okay. And to, to finalize this, we are to the future. We are working on a best practice and lessons learned document. So maybe we can get in touch and continue moving this conversation further. Thank you. Thank you, Franco. We have um, Maria Fernanda Martinez from CETIS, next on the list. Hello, my name is Fernanda. I'm from CETIS. CETIS is a center of studies on technology and society of the University of San Andres, based in Argentina. It's a inter-multidisciplinary space for researchers and divulgations on politics related to internet. This year was, uh, we have a lot of initiatives. I want to mention two of them. One took place two weeks ago in Montevideo. We are working on a project uh, called Proyecto Guía that involves uh, a lot of partners and researchers from uh, Latin America and the Caribbean. Some of them, uh, of think tanks, are here with us. We are uh, elaborating different documents related to the impact, uh, the impact of the intelligent artificials related to the ethics. So, this, in this uh, space, we, we we debate about this, and on March the next year we are going to publish the results uh, on our site. So uh, we keep in touch on this. And on July we have another meeting, important meeting, with uh, regional and European experts of copyright because we have a, an intensive about the legislation of that uh, project. Um, you can find all the transcriptions of the debate in our site. Although we continue with our academic programs, we have two of them. One is the Diploma on Internet Governance. This year, the third edition took place in Brazil, but the next year will take place in Mexico. We are going to do it uh, with the CIDE. So it's a very, in, it's an immersed and summer program for 
activists, it, researchers, and public uh, person who are interested in the governance on the internet. We have some technical, legal, and social, as, social economical aspects of that uh, issue. And although we have some publications, we can find all of them in our site. In, and if you have any further information, you can contact me. Well, as a, one or another thing, uh, yes, we have a, a new pro, and we have a program, a present program, the ITC, and, and, and this last, uh, the next year we are going to start to uh, online courses. The first of them are going to be the of governance courses directed with Carolina Guerre and internet legislation for, uh, directed for Pablo Palassi. So if you have any doubt, you can contact me or uh, go to our page. Thank you. Thank you, Maria Fernanda. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, Colnodo, Julian Casabuena next on the list, and then Faro Digital. So. Uh, again, I'm going to ask you to be really brief uh, in order to keep more pace. So, thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Julian Casasbuenas, uh, Director of uh, Colnodo in Colombia. I would like to share with you some activities we have been involved, uh, especially with community networks. Uh, we uh, deploy um, experience in, in Colombia with the support of uh, uh, Fondo Frida uh, from uh, LACNIC and also another one in um, Buenos Aires, Cauca with the support of various, well that was quick, <laughs> okay with the support of APC, ISOC, uh, Rizomatica from Mexico and Altermundi uh, in um, Argentina. Uh, this experience includes uh, also ICT appropriation with a, a gender uh, approach. And in this uh, framework, we had the opportunity to work with the Ministry of ICTs in Colombia uh, to document uh, the experience that will serve um, uh, as a memory construction to establish recommendations, overcome difficulties, challenges, and evaluate this uh, feasibility model in other parts of the country and perhaps in the region. We have been using the Libre Router uh, uh, equipment that also was funded by Frida and others uh, to deploy this kind of community network. So it has been a very um, uh, interesting experiences uh, with uh, other uh, organizations in, in, in the region. Uh, in the framework of the uh, project with uh, Fondo Frida, uh, we launched recently a website. It's called redescomunitarias.co, where uh, you can get information about the experiences, uh, also uh, information about, uh, uh, for instance, the Summit of Community Networks that we have uh, this year in Colombia and with the participation of uh, many members of the region, mm -hmm. uh, reports of, of, of those meetings and information related to the experiences of community networks in, in Colombia. Uh, as well, we, um, in, in other project, we deploy a platform called Crea in tu idioma that was uh, developed uh, in order to offer quality content uh, for training in digital innovation issues uh, that connect uh, with the demand of knowledge uh, for entrepreneurships, uh, small and medium uh, uh, organizations, uh, youth in Latin American countries and uh, Caribbean with uh, offer of uh, 11 uh, training courses uh, online. And finally, I would like to share with you that at the beginning of this month, we have our sixth Colombian um, IGF, uh, where we um, uh, did uh, in a couple of days, the first day, workshops related uh, to how internet works, the multi-stakeholder participation mechanisms, digital security, privacy, and data protection. And in the second day of the forum, 
um, uh, panels related to actions in internet governance to connect the unconnected, freedom of expression, uh, challenges of work in the digital age, and um, um, if it's a reform of the law protection of personal data necessary. I mention this because uh, we are also bringing here to the Global Forum um, uh, the participation uh, in the uh, session of uh, collaborative session in, in access of uh, national and regional initiatives as well as the main session and also we are willing to continue participating in the regional forum next year in Chile. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Now we have Nicolás uh, Ibáñez from Faro Digital. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Nicolás Ibáñez, uh, co-founder and innovation director of Faro Digital. Faro, or Digital Lighthouse, it's an Argentinian NGO that promotes digital well-being among youth and kids. Uh, we mainly literate on safety, on disinformation, and on creative uses of digital spaces. We work in schools with also helping teachers and parents to to deal with, with all the new uh, challenges that technology is, is facing us. Um, I want just to tell you three short projects. Uh, the first one is uh, a project we, are, we launched this year with UNICEF. It's called Rap Digital or Digital Rap, that mainly it's a platform, a crowdsourcing platform that invites kids and teens to make their own rap videos promoting the good values and tackling violence online. So we already have a winner this year on, and we are producing the winner's video. Uh, so it's kind of uh, innovative because we are talking uh, in kids uh, co on codes as rap music is. So, sorry, another project is a research one called Ablatam. We are doing with Universidad de Chile, ITS Rio, uh, and Universidad de Uruguay. We are uh, re researching on digital skills of the youth in Argentina, Colombia, Uruguay, Chile, and Argentina. Uh, in this first chapter, we are also looking for the content gaps online the, the kids have to learn new new skills and also to know about their their critical thinking abilities to tackle this information. So, and the last one is um, a project we are partnered up with Facebook. It's called Soy Digital and it's a literacy program for young and adults uh, about di uh, digital citizenship in, in the whole country in eight provinces in Argentina. We reached this year 6,000 people. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Nicolás. Now we have Sebastián Belagamba from Internet Society. Hello, everyone. I'm Sebastián Belagamba. I'm the uh, Regional Director for Latin America and the Caribbean at the Internet Society. Uh, the Internet Society is an international organization that um, promotes the, um, an, um, sorry, an open, uh, globally connected, trustworthy internet for, for everyone. Um, we have a network of uh, more than 110 chapters around the world, 24 of them located in, in Latin America and the Caribbean, and um, more than 60,000 members uh, worldwide. We are focusing on the two main things that uh, get uh, our attention today is that um, the uh, still 47% of the world population is not yet connected to the internet, uh, so we need to fix that. And the other big important thing that we are concerned is that those that are connected are not trusting the internet the, the way they used to do. Um, so, in order to address that, that uh, next year we are focusing on eight projects. Our action plan has been launched uh, just yesterday, so I invite you to go through the eight projects that we are going to run next year in our action plan, because it's going to be uh, too long to, to describe the eight of them for, for you all, and I, I don't want to abuse the time. But um, our action plan for 2020 is uh, available at the, uh, our website in www.internetsociety.org. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Sebastián. Uh, now we're going to go to Raúl Echeverría, who conduct, conducted uh, a study on the LACIGF. 
so he can present the conclusions of this study. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nacho. I'm, I'm trying to speak in English and I'm reading my notes in Spanish. Let's see how it works. Uh, as you said, um, oh, uh, first of all, uh, I'm not representing anybody here, just uh, uh, reporting about this uh, open consultation that uh, I was in charge of leading uh, about the review of LAC IGF. There are many people around the table and here in the room that, uh, that are members of the LAC IGF program committee and they are much more um, in, in a better capacity to speak uh, uh, about the LAC IGF. Uh, the, the process uh, was a very participative process. Uh, um, almost 160 people participated through individual interviews, uh, through open uh, meetings uh, that were conducted in the three common languages, most common languages in, uh, in, in the region, English, Spanish, and Portuguese. Um, Beside that, we also held some face-to-face uh, -face meetings, uh, taking advantage of uh, populated meetings in the, in the region. And there were uh, very valuable agreements uh, among uh, most of the participants, uh, like the value of like IGF for the community and the need to introduce uh, improvements. And I recommend you to read the, the, the report if you didn't do it uh, yet. Um, but the, the, all the, the comments were classified in six uh, categories, uh, participation, contents of the meeting, uh, format of the sessions, the structure of the LAC IGF itself, intersessional work, and funding. And about participation, the, some uh, highlights is the, the the, the, some of the, the things that are um, um, included in the comments are the need for more outreach to um, um, make available the details of the meeting, agenda, speakers uh, with more time in advance, to have more formal communication with governments. Uh, many governments uh, say that that is difficult for them to engage more formally and deeply in the, in the process if there are no formal communication through the um, foreign affairs uh, ministries, and also the implementation of high-level sessions. Uh, high-level sessions, sorry. Um, about contents, the recommendations are to have more um, focused uh, contents, to contemplate the diversity of the region, as things, uh, issues that are a priority for some countries are not a priority in, uh, for uh, another country because they are in different uh, levels of development, so the, the agenda is, should be diverse and should be attractive for everybody. That the, the, the topic should be defined as they are done today through the open consultations, but also consulted with more formal consultations and public consultations through organized actors, and also taking the input from local IGFs. Uh, there are um, consensus on the need to produce more concrete outcomes, and there are some proposals like producing outcomes uh, uh, like uh, principles, uh, general guidelines uh, to address uh, specific issues, and identification of uh, priorities uh, for the region. With regard to the formats, the, there is a, um, a claim to have a more interactive and more innovative formats for the sessions. The people uh, comment uh, repeatedly that the, it's, um, um, I would say, boring to go to, to is it not for me? Yes? That? Okay. Um, to, to just to go to the sessions to see the, some people speaking uh, and to have a less repetition of speakers and moderators. And uh, about the, the sessional, uh, the intersessional work, to have more formal groups, uh, virtual working groups, uh, and to advance the, the work that will be presented in the, in the annual meetings toward the possibility of uh, getting some agreements on, on general principles. And there is a, a, a claim to have a, to see more leadership from and more visibility from the program committee, to have more clear responsibilities and roles defined within the, the, the program committee. And there is a significant uh, support to have a, a, a dedicated secretariat. Um, the, so those are the, the biggest things. There are also some recommendations, practical recommendations about the next steps. I understand this was presented in the LAC-IGF meeting in, in August in Bolivia, in La Paz. 
And since that, I understand that the program committee has been working on some implementation of some of the, of the recommendations. Um, my recommendation to everybody, as I said before, is to, is to read this and to become engaged in the discussion um, because the, any change should be done in a very collaborative uh, way with the participation of everybody. Okay. Thank you very much, Raul. Uh, as Raul was saying, the, the program committee of the LAC IGF is working on this, on some of the recommendations, and we're going to be doing a really, really short presentation later in this session on how we think it could be implement, implemented. Uh, next in line is Abdias Zambrano from Ipandetec. I don't know. No? Oh, over there. Casey James from Ipandetec. Oh. Nice to meet you, and it's a very good privilege for me to be here and to present to you our nonprofit organization which promotes the use and regulations of ICTs and the defense of human rights in the digital environment for Central America. Some of the projects that we have had during this year, I would like to begin with our Central American study for data protection, which we presented or launched in January. And since July, we have done many different events to promote it locally on each of the countries from Central America. And this 3rd of December, we will be launching it at Guatemala. So all of those there are invited to participate and to see the results of this study. Also in topics of gender, we have a gender violence online monitoring to candidates of popular election positions. And we did this for Panama and for Guatemala. And on the 11th of December, we'll be presenting the results. And we did this with Usuarios Digitales from Ecuador. Also, we are the host for the IGF in Panama. And this year in July the 24th, we had our session. It was a uh, an all-day journey, and we had about 200 persons involved, including uh, media represented. Also for privacy, we did Who Has Your Back Panama version 2019. This is our first version of this study, and we did it along with Electronic Frontier Foundation, and we presented it on August. For a fifth year consecutive, we had our privacy and data protection forum in Central America. We did it at El Salvador because we took into context the global and the recent aspects or discussion of a law project in this country, and also having in mind the deputy Margarita Escobar, who is um, participating as a parliamentary, a Central America parliamentary in this event. Also for cybersecurity, in the month of October, um, in the month of conscience of cybersecurity, we did a series of events in all Central America with a special relevance in Honduras to generate capacities in the topic of cybersecurity, which has been wrong discussed or talked about during the Congress. Also, we in the, men, in the month of February, we will launch our second regional study. And in this occasion, it will be about cybersecurity in all Central America. Our upcoming projects for next year, we are the host for the biggest Congress in open data was a, for a region which is Abre la Taman con Datos. And we would like to invite you all to participate with us. It will be in Panama City. And well, as Ipan de Tech, we are the host. And we hope to see all of you there and to share together many information. You can contact us or see us in all our social media as at Ipan de Tech and also on our web page, www.ipandetech.org. Thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, less than, no, I think, 25 minutes, and we have 12 presenters. So I'm going to ask you to be more brief. <laughs> two minutes each. I'm sorry, but that's the time we have. So two minutes for uh, Esteban Lescano from LAC ISP. Hi. Just to be quick, um, I want to introduce uh, LAC ISP that is a new organization in the region that was, um, uh, was created uh, past April. This uh, organization um, is, is a federation of ISP association and organization of Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, we represent uh, ISP's organizations in, um, in, in many countries, but 
uh, at this uh, uh, stage, uh, we have 10 organizations from uh, Brazil, Argentina, Colombia, Mexico, uh, and Ecuador. We represent, through our members, uh, 3,000 ISPs in the region. Uh, our main objectives are to, to, to collaborate with the, the ISPs organization, uh, interchanging uh, best practices information, and also to contribute with uh, public authorities in, uh, in uh, policies and regulation to, uh, um, uh, for, for, for ISPs. And we are based in Uruguay, in the Casa Internet, and uh, where we are welcoming uh, new members, uh, uh, ISPs, uh, from our organization of ISPs and the region, and also we, we are ready to, to work with all the organizations uh, in the region in uh, IGF issues. Thank you. Thank you, Esteban. Uh, Gabriel Adonailo. Hi, everyone. My name is Gabriel Adonailo. I'm a board member of LACNIC. However, I will uh, speak on behalf of LACIX which is the uh, Latin American and Caribbean Internet Exchange Points Association. The Internet exchanges are uh, considered uh, a part of the uh, critical infrastructure of the uh, Internet because they bring uh, cost optimization and routing efficiency. Um, we are roughly 70 IXPs in the region associated to our organization, represented by 13 members all across Latin America and the uh, Caribbean region. We are part of a federation, which is the uh, Internet Exchange Federation, which is uh, it's a global organization. Uh, we, have, we are four members, the uh, Latin American and the Caribbean, the uh, Europeans, Asia Pacific, and uh, Africa represented. We uh, coordinate the uh, peering forum, the uh, Latin American and the Caribbean peering forum together with uh, LACNIC and LACNOG, which is the uh, technical community. We uh, look after creating synergies with other organizations. This is something very uh, important here today, uh, we, um, we signed MOUs with the uh, Internet Society, with LACNIC, with uh, LACTLD as well. We are working together as a team in the region. Um, what have we done so far this uh, past year? Uh, well, we have new members, we, we brought new members. Uh, we organized the appearing uh, forum with uh, more than 200 participants in Punta Cana, and we uh, implemented a global database for IXPs, which is IXPDB, more than 170 uh, IXPs represented in that automated database. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gabriel. Now we have Kevon and Carolina from LACNIC. Thank you very much, Nacho, and thank you for providing this space. Uh, my name is Kevon. I'm Head of Strategic Relations and Integration at LACNIC, one of five regional internet registries that manages and distributes internet resources in the world. I'll be very brief. Um, the first update would be on our inter-IR policy. Um, this is a policy that's applicable in three of the five RIRs allowing the transfer of resources. What that means is that we do not stop promoting IPv6, but this policy will actually enable a secondary market where IPv4 resources could be acquired into the region. The second point I will touch on is our Mass Raises project. This is a project to install Anycat's root server copies across the globe, well, across our region. Um, given after this year's call, um, we have actually uh, selected four beneficiaries uh, for this project. And the next point I will touch on is our online training, LACNIC Campus. Um, we have expanding our offering. Um, traditionally, we offered basic IPv6, advanced IPv6, and BGP RPKI. Now we have network management, um, introductory course to network security, and an IPv6 course available in English for our non-Spanish-speaking members. And now I will hand over to Carolina. 
Thank you, Kevin. That was very quick. <laughs> I'll try to um, be brief as well. So I just wanted to share um, two updates from uh, the development and cooperation uh, work that we do at LACNIC. Uh, last year, I mentioned we were working in a project in Haiti called IT Goes Global. Um, it was a project that was seeking to develop digital um, skills and connect um, young Haitian women with uh, online work opportunities. Um, and this year, the project actually came to a close. Um, at this IGF, this morning, actually, we had a uh, workshop on the future of work in the Global South, where we presented some of the results um, of this initiative. Anyone working on future of work interested in hearing uh, what we've learned through this project, um, we are um, you know, at your disposal to, to talk and um, sort of share some lessons. Uh, the last point that I wanted to leave you with, um, so Frida, uh, the Frida program, grants and awards program uh, that uh, LACNIC runs in, in the region, um, is present at IGF. We're giving our um, uh, award on community networks in a workshop that starts now at, at 3 p.m., organized by the colleagues from APC and ISOC, so we invite you to come along. Um, and we have news for um, our work next year. Um, Frida will be actually um, uh, updating its uh, thematic areas of focus, uh, so the topics that we'll be uh, sort of supporting. Um, and the news is that we'll be offering a new line of funding uh, on uh, more sort of technical projects uh, around stability and internet security. Uh, we, are, you know, in terms of sort of projects with sort of uh, a social focus, we'll con um, uh, continue working on um, internet access projects. Uh, we are expanding from just the community networks focus that we've had thus far to other areas that we uh, find are relevant uh, in terms of promoting internet access in the region. Um, and lastly, the third uh, thematic category will be um, uh, promoting uh, an open and free internet. So we look forward to collaborating with um, all the organizations here um, that are working on these three topics, uh, feel, free, uh, feel free to reach out to me and um, you know, we can discuss uh, any feedback that you may have for us. That would be all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now it's my turn. Uh, well, my name is Nacho Estrada from LACTLD. LACTLD is the association of CCTLD's operators. CCTLD's are country code top level domains. Um, I'm going to be really short. I'm going to talk about just two projects. One, one is our Anycast Cloud project. Um, it's, a, it's an open project for any CCTLDs from the region uh, to make use of this cloud and for any, I would say, ISP, IXP, CCTLD, or whoever has a data center with certain capacities uh, installed to host nodes, nodes and extend the, the, this, this net, this cloud. Um, the idea is to bring more resiliency for the CCTLDs of the region. Um, also, I'm, I want to speak about the illegal online content workshop we did for just judges, prosecutors, and LAAs from Latin America and the Caribbean. We did it in Bogota um, during August, <laughs> as far as I remember. And we'll be doing it again uh, in Cancun, uh, the days before ICANN meeting uh, in March. It, it will be the 5 and 6 of, of March. Um, we have many things uh, I would like to talk about, but uh, I'm going to give the floor to the next one, uh, Nick.br. Juliano. Excuse me. I'll talk briefly about two initiatives developed by, in Brazil by the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee. The first is the Brazilian School on Internet Governance, which started in 2014. In 2015, we decided, decided to produce the first course specifically prepared to debate legal challenges. And what we found out was that we had uh, many opportunities to uh, develop courses uh, specifically prepared to, to treat issues and uh, to attend specific actors. Um, since that, we developed a, developed a course with, uh, in, uh, with the Ministry of Defense we have accredited a course at the School of Instructions of Magistrates of Brazil, at the National School of Magistrates, 
and we worked already three editions. We have produced a few courses with uh, academic study centuries on specific issues like data economy, data protection, uh, content regulation, and so on. And we are working on an agreement to develop a course with the Brazilian Public Prosecution Office. Uh, the second initiative is the Brazilian Internet Governance Forum, held since 2010 in several, several cities in the country. This year, 2009, we had the ninth edition in the city of Manaus, capital of the state of Amazon. The forum format has been redesigned a few times, but since 2017, we, are, it had, we have matured um, um, the programming format, what looks now pretty much alike what is done in IGF. We invited Brazilian society as a whole to submit proposals for activities which are evaluated by a Brazilian committee of internet governance specialists. This committee is multi-sectoral, formed with region and gender balance, and the evaluation is done in two steps. The first, a blind evaluation of the merit of a proposal, such as pertinence of the theme in relation to internet governance, gender distribution, etc. In the second, once the proposal have been ranked, the commission selects the workshop on the basis of diversity criteria. We consider region, gender, topic of debate, and etc. And this is it. Thank you very much, Juliano. Now, Gustavo Gomez from Observacom. Hola, Nacho, muchas gracias. Pido disculpas a los colegas de Caribe de habla inglesa y a los colegas brasileros pero mi idioma es el español y no logro comunicarme adecuadamente en otra lengua. Gracias, Nacho, por empujar, como decía Franco, estos espacios. Así sean dos minutos, es, es muy importante encontrarnos. Gracias por, por la persistencia en este esfuerzo. Observacom es un think tank regional con base en Uruguay, eh, profesional, independiente de gobiernos y también independiente de empresas que trabaja con foco en libertad de expresión. Estamos muy preocupados por eh, las regulaciones y políticas sobre Internet que pueden afectar justamente el derecho fundamental a la libertad de expresión y nos preocupan tanto las regulaciones estatales como las regulaciones privadas. Y en ese sentido, el esfuerzo nuestro ha sido colaborar con otras organizaciones para impedir, evitar, limitar los intentos legislativos de gobiernos por regular ciertos aspectos de Internet que terminan afectando la libertad de expresión y también estamos desarrollando acciones para mostrar evidencias y compartir la preocupación sobre el creciente papel que tienen algunas plataformas de intermedia plataformas de contenido sobre el derecho a la libertad de expresión de sus usuarios e incluso sobre la Internet libre y abierta que, que tanto pregonamos. En ese sentido... Ustedes entenderán que este tema ha estado en discusión en el mundo. En América Latina nos hemos incorporado recientemente, pero estamos bastante preocupados sobre esta cuestión de la moderación de contenidos. Las alternativas no son muchas y no son buenas. En general, los remedios a este problema han sido peores que la enfermedad. Y por tanto, un conjunto de organizaciones latinoamericanas entre algunas que estamos aquí, como Intervoces, EIDEC de Brasil, Desarrollo Digital de Argentina, TEDIC de Paraguay, ProLedi de Costa Rica, CAINFO de Uruguay, o Usuarios Digitales de Ecuador. Hemos trabajado para pro presentar una propuesta que está hoy accesible para todos ustedes aquí y que les invitamos a conocer, que busca este, establecer, proponer una perspectiva latinoamericana para encarar el problema de la moderación privada de contenidos y limitar el poder de unas pocas y concentradas corporaciones transnacionales en el derecho de sus usuarios de esas plataformas. Una propuesta que sea democrática, equilibrada, adecuada al entorno digital, que sea compatible con estándares internacionales de derechos humanos. Nuestro lema sería una propuesta que no sea ni Silicon Valley, ni China, y tampoco Europa, una propuesta latinoamericana basada en los principales principios del sistema interamericano de derechos humanos que pueda dar respuesta adecuada a estos desafíos. Si ustedes, alguno de ustedes está preocupado por esta creciente intervención de los intermediarios y su impacto en la libertad de expresión de sus usuarios, 
y en una Internet libre y abierta. Pero como nosotros está, jamás aceptaría formas de regulación estatal abusivas, creo que tenemos una buena propuesta que deberían considerar. En el sitio web www.observacom.org, esta decena de organizaciones latinoamericanas y varios expertos, algunos de los cuales están aquí presentes, han este, tratado de reflejar los principios que defendemos para tratar de poner límites a un poder que en los comienzos de Internet no estaba presente y que hoy cuestiona los propios paradigmas en los que creímos cuando impulsamos la red de redes. Gracias. Muchas gracias, Gustavo. Eh, seguimos con Olga Cavalli de la Escuela del Sur de Gobernanza. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Now it's Olga Cavalli from the South School of Internet Governance. Oh, oh yes. I made it. Yes. Uh, thank you, Nacho. Thank you very much. Um, very briefly, the South School of Internet Governance was organized in Mexico in May in the Secretary of Economy of the Government of Mexico with a participation of 250 fellow. Uh, no, I think it's working. And um, of course, free for everyone who applies. We could give 60 fellowships with hotel and meals plus the training program with, for fellows from all over the region. Of course, as usual, we had simultaneous translation, English, Spanish, and remote participation. Uh, we are defining now where the 2020 edition, which is the 12th edition, will be. We will let you know if you follow us on, on social networks about fellowships and all that. We organized the third edition of Argensig, the Argentina School of Internet Governance, with 250 participants organized in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, with 40 fellows receiving hotel and meals, and the rest, of course, free for the community. Uh, we published the version in English of the book, Internet Governance and Regulations in Latin America. You may recall that the Spanish version was presented last year in the IGF in, in UNESCO in Paris. In June in, the, in, in Rio de Janeiro, in, in, in the location of the FGV, Fundación Getulio Vargas pre presented the Portuguese version, and now it's in English. It's not printed. It's a huge book of 600 pages, so you can uh, take a brochure from our booth here nearby, or you can download directly from the website. Uh, what else? Um, I think that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olga. Uh, Maria Paz from Derechos Digitales. Thank you very much. Um, I will not take much time because we don't have much time neither. Um, so only highlight a uh, a few points of the work that as Derechos Digitales we have been doing. So we continue supporting the issues uh, about internet governance through the participation in uh, the uh, coordination committee for Latin American IGF and also I am uh, being renewed as a, a MAG member for the Global IGF this year. So again, maybe uh, this information I was not able to provide it last meeting last year, but uh, just uh, all the Latin American community let uh, know, I want to let you know that I am here available to represent uh, whatever uh, you feel that is relevant at the global setting of uh, the internet governance. So use uh, myself as a resource and as a channel of communication uh, with the MAG. Um, I would be happy to uh, stay more connected uh, to what are uh, your needs uh, the, than uh, different from what happened probably the last year in which I tried to connect with the work uh, of the Latin American uh, IGF coordinating committee, but not much with the, the community at large in a more structured way. Although I always hear what I, uh, and try to represent what I see in, in the larger community, but uh, it's not a, a, a something that had taken a, a more structured way, so just do it uh, and take that uh, advantage to communicate with me and, and send me any kind of information or request that you think that is relevant. So uh, moving to Derechos Digitales specific word, uh, as you may know, because we organized a session uh, at the zero day of IGF, uh, we have been working intensively in the last year in the issue of uh, use of surveillance technology in the region, and we are trying to push forward the conversation for 
for uh, having legal standards in the region for the use of this information. Uh, but the thing is that uh, this is something that we need also uh, much more information from the community. And for that uh, purposes, we are putting uh, a website uh, together specifically for all the uh, different initiatives in the region re regarding the facial recognition used for public safety or for uh, social welfare purposes in the region also. And we intend to, this to be a resource for the community for everyone to understand better uh, what is going on, how to strategize, to try to push forward in, in different countries for, for the legal standard for the use of this surveillance technology. And this is very connected uh, with something that also Vladimir Cortez from Article 19 was mentioning. Uh, all the use of these technologies, it's more relevant now uh, in, in, even in the region because all the, the social movements and the exercise of the, uh, of the right uh, to protest uh, and to peace a peacefully assembly. So we think that this is a discussion very on time and, and we need to have it at the regional level. Uh, and uh, the last thing that I want to give, like just a short uh, intervention to Jamila Venturini, which is our regional coordinator of Derechos Digitales, and she will present briefly our uh, rapid response phone. Uh, very quickly, thank you, Maria Paz. It's a pleasure to be here. Just uh, wanted to let everybody know that we launched the first uh, rapid response fund in Latin America for digital rights. It's open for all countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, and it's focused, it has a very global reach, not only digital rights, but any emergency that you find in your region and that you need to react. The idea is this fund to be very unbureaucratic and uh, quick to provide funds so you can give a, a quick answer to any type of emergency. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now we have uh, Elaine Ford from D&D, &D, am I right, Elaine? Sorry, Elaine, I'm going to interrupt you just for a second. Um, since you just mentioned it, uh, Maria Paz is a MAG member, uh, and we have a new MAG member uh, just named Roberto Zambrana here. And I don't know if, congratulations, Roberto. Uh, I would like to give her a I don't know if there's any other MAG member in the floor from the region. You? Former or? Oh, yeah, because you, are, because you were pre-host. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so anything you, any questions, any suggestions, and whatever you have to the IGF, to the global IGF, you have to go with these three guys in here. OK, sorry, Elaine, you can. Thank you very much, Nacho. Hello, I'm Elaine Ford. I'm president of ISOC Peru. I'm also director and founder of D and D International Digital Democracy, the IDE Internacional Democracia Digital. And from there, uh, we promote the responsible use of internet all over Peru. We have developed uh, different lines of action and different projects all over the country. We train, we alert, we create awareness about different topics uh, of the digital ecosystem. We work with political parties, Congress, local and regional governments, and mainly citizens. But I want to share with you one of our latest initiatives that was launched last week. Uh, it is the Digital Democracy National Observatory which is related to another initiative we promote in Peru since six years ago, uh, which is the Digital Democracy National Award. Uh, this award allows us to know about how technology is used in Peru with different purposes in four categories, citizens, civil society, public sector, and private sector. Uh, these purposes could be to give services, to share information, to make social changes in communities or in local areas. And after six years of this award, we decide to build this observatory, a web platform that gathers 340 initiatives from, from 16 regions in Peru. Uh, the proposals have been organized and geolocated according to the regions of the country. It also has uh, different engines by geo, category, and thematic areas such as pol politics and governance, social, cultural, health, and education. And this allows 
to give visibility to the work that is already taking place in the different cities all around the country. Also, allows uh, to replicate good digital practices, especially in those cities where um, access to internet is still quite limited. So you can visit this observatory is democraciadigital.pe slash observatorio. Uh, and this is a, a very good initiative that I would like to share with you. Please visit. And also, I want to mention that this Friday I will launch this book um, that I published some months ago. And this is a good opportunity to share with you the LAC community this Friday in room 5 at 1 o'clock p.m. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Elaine. Now we have Guillermo Canela from UNESCO. I thank you. Good afternoon. I will be brief as well. <clears throat> I will going to mention nine UNESCO initiatives in the region. As most many of you know, I'm the regional advisor for those issues in Latin America and the Caribbean. And most of those initiatives, or all of them, are being executed in partnerships of with many of you in this room. Actually, I'm just the international bureaucrat facilitating your work uh, on those areas. So first, the judges initiative. As uh, you know, we have been training lots of judicial operators all over the region, more than 13,000 judges and prosecutors now. Tomorrow we'll have a session about this uh, with judges from different courts, so you are most welcome to show up. Secondly, we have been publishing this year several policy documents that are related to these issues on OTTs, ownership concentration, discussing those issues with regulators, also one on fake news and elections for, regulatory, for electoral authorities. We have been developing third and, and work with uh, journalists. We are convinced that journalists are covering badly issues related to internet, artificial intelligence, etc. So we are preparing uh, different sorts of materials for training journalists on this. We have been supporting several governments in the region, some of them in this room, to apply the internet universality indicators. Uh, they presented some results uh, last Monday. We have been launched, we launched a, a MOOC for the connecting ICTs and SDGs. More than uh, 1,700 people are taking this MOOC this very moment from 134 countries. But most of these people are from Latin America since we just translated it to English, uh, sorry, to Spanish, and next year Portuguese. Um, we did a very interesting first initiative with YouTubers uh, this year in El Salvador, with YouTubers from the region. That was very interesting as well. Um, eighth, we are uh, developing several programs on media and information literacy in the region, mainly in training teachers on that. And finally, uh, in 10 days' time, we will have uh, UNESCO uh, Artificial Intelligence Forum from Latin America and Caribbean in Sao Paulo with the Brazilian government in uh, CGI.br, CTIKTOK.br. All, you all are, of course, more than invited to go or to watch it online. Thank you. Thank you very much, Guilherme. We had uh, the Youth IGF Observatory, but I don't think Nicolas is not around and Federico neither Federico, so we're not going to be going with the next and last thing. You, what you see on the screen is uh, the proposal that the LAC, LAC IGF uh, Agenda Committee came up after the study Raul did, Raul Echeverria did. Uh, this would be kind of the, the structure we want to, the structure, yeah, we want to achieve for the next like IGFs. Uh, I'm gonna explain a little. Uh, this structure is not kind of defined because uh, there will be an open consultation uh, in order for all of you uh, give your feedback. The, the main thing here, or the main, the main things will be uh, uh, presented I'm sorry, the, the main thing is the, the annual meeting. I'm sorry, it's in Spanish. Uh, uh, I thought we, we will be ha having this in Spanish, but uh, the, the green square over there is the annual meeting. And during the annual meeting, the idea is to present study documents, uh, success cases, workshops, and, and have a high-level meeting. So all you can see on the left 
of this green square uh, is going to be the process to achieve those results. Uh, the main thing here is uh, we're going to be having a high-level meeting where the idea is to invite uh, mostly governments and to present to them the results of the three previous uh, activities, the workshops, the success cases, and the study docu the documents uh, of the studies conducted previously. Uh, the community is going to be suggesting some themes. Uh, the the actual community, the agenda community, the, the name, the idea is the name to change to uh, multi-stakeholder committee, is going to be selecting from those suggested, suggested, uh, sorry, my tongue is <laughs> suggested topics, uh, the most, Im the, what uh, they believe are the most important, and using those topics, uh, working uh, or study groups are going to be creating, created in order to work through the year and then present them, uh, present their results in the annual meeting. Uh, during the year also, success, case, success cases are gonna be um, uh, revised and selected, and also the, uh, we're gonna be asking uh, the ones who develop those cases to present them in the annual meeting. And the idea is to create another committee, uh, a, a similar committee as the MAG, as the Global IGF MAG, it's a, a workshop selection committee, and it's, the idea is for this committee to work as the MAG is working. So they're going to be receiving workshop, work, workshop proposals and selecting the best ones according to the uh, pre-selected themes and some criteria uh, we're going to be define, defining within the committee and with the feedback of the community. And then those workshops are the one uh, that are going to be, um, uh, be, <laughs> be done uh, in, uh, during the, the annual meeting. I don't know, uh, we have here Alejandra, we have Maria Paz, and uh, I don't know if there's an, another member from the, the committee that want to have a, any comment. Who's there? Um, ah, and Valeria, sorry. Uh, <laughs> see you, Valeria. Um, Sure. Um, only to summarize that the idea of these changes is trying to hear what community was saying for a long time, that we need to review the way in which the Latin American IGF was working. So also um, taking ideas from uh, what was the report from Raul Echeverria that he mentioned it a few minutes ago. And in, in many senses, I mean, we can have back the, the slide, it would be better than myself in the screen. Uh, um, the idea of this is um, precisely um, to kind of mirror some of the good things that the global IGF extractor has. For example, the idea of having more participation of the community in the drafting of the program through the workshop proposal. So that's new because so far the, the workshops were selected by the, the coordination committee uh, that is a multi-stakeholder, but uh, it's not the same that the community itself. So this new model, it's a huge opportunity for the community to be much more active in the drafting and shaping of uh, what will be the next Latin American IGF. And I really invite you to take that opportunity because we will need your participation. If you are not on top of this uh, new uh, challenge uh, of uh, rebuilding and reshaping the Latin American IGF, it will be impossible for us as a committee to move by ourselves this process. So, as uh, Nacho was mentioning, uh, this idea of, uh, 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 of uh, doing a consultation first uh, for receiving feedback in the model, but also then we have a structure, uh, an agenda for uh, going through the different steps that were ex explained by, by Nacho in, in the selection of the topics and then in the call for the workshops and in the selection for the members of the committee that will be uh, picking the, the workshop that will uh, go into the program, all that need a lot of participation. And um, uh, in, in that sense, I don't know if I, I should move on with presenting a little bit of the agenda or some of the other members want to comment We something. have to leave the room in two minutes. So okay. Please go forward with the agenda. Okay. So, 
of course, uh, as usual, we are kind of uh, running out of time <laughs> for the session and for the agenda that we originally thought. So we thought maybe we will be communicating this more in November, but at the beginning of the November, so we are doing at the end of November. But uh, the consultation process will come uh, through December, and through December and, and January, we will be uh, running the survey for picking the topics of the agenda. So in that sense, at the end of uh, February 2020 and beginning of March 2020, we will be able to make the call for presenting the, the proposals uh, for the workshops. And in parallel of this, uh, it will be running the, the, the process uh, during uh, December and January. We will be doing the call for selecting the member of the selection committee for the workshop. Um, so the, the idea, the original idea in this agenda, it's um, to have April 2020 for the selection of the workshops by this committee that will be selected at that point. Uh, and then uh, in, in a, at the end of, of April, when we have already the selection of the workshop, we can make the call for the, um, the support for, uh, for the different uh, people that need uh, travel support for the IGF in order to also uh, provide uh, some kind of uh, uh, preferential treatment to the ones that had workshop that had been selected. So this is an incentive to present proposals, uh, with quality proposal, because the, the ones that uh, need after travel support for participating and have a, a, a workshop proposal will have uh, some kind of uh, additional points in the evaluation for, for uh, the travel support for the IGF. Maria Paz, I'm sorry, we have to leave. <laughs> sure. I'm really sorry. Thank you, everybody, for coming, attending, presenting, and staying. And we will be sending this information yes. soon by email for the channel of communication of IGF, like IGF, so more soon. Okay. Thank if you, everybody. If there's any question of this, you can yeah. reach us in, in the corridor. Thank you.